Gavin McHale, welcome to the show. Man, I'm excited to be here. I, you have no idea. Being on Craig Ballantyne's podcast. Wow. Well, listen, not only on Craig Ballantyne's podcast, but you're one of our top coaches in our program and our effortless discipline boot camp, and you're helping people getting amazing results. Now, before we jump into your discipline tips, because I know I want to talk to you about discipline, but also mindset because you were a pro athlete. Give us the 60 second life story of Gavin McHale, the son of blue collar parents from (laughs) Winnipeg who went pro in the, uh, in hockey and then became part of our effortless discipline coaching team. Yeah. Pressure, pressure, pressure. Um, yeah. Uh, grew up with a, uh, a cop and a teacher for parents. Um, so, you know, not necessarily blue collar, but definitely nine to five mindset mm-hmm. and um, went away, you know, being from Winnipeg, Canada, what else do you do? You play hockey, uh, you went play away hockey and you drink beer, and, and, but not, <laughs> but not, but you don't always have to do it in that order because I know from no. Stratford, Ontario, I, I sometimes say that you play hockey and drink beer, or you drink beer, then play hockey. It doesn't, it really doesn't matter. matter. As long as both of them are involved, people are, people are happy, you know? Uh, so lots of beer drinking, lots of hockey playing. And I ended up uh, getting to go out West uh, to play in the Western hockey league. Um, I got to get my university paid for and all that through hockey um, and found that I was not wanting to buy into the nine to five world. I was not wanting to, to do that. So I went into personal training, essentially an extension of the hockey locker room, right? Is, is the gym and personal training. So I really enjoyed that side of it. Um, spent many years doing the training thing and, and then got into more of the, I just found that I was wanting to, to help people with their life more than just, you know, how to deadlift and how to squat just their whole life. I was realizing that there was more to that. So got into more of the personal development and business coaching space, which of course uh, brought me to you and to the Craig Ballantyne early to rise world. And now here we are uh, helping people with their discipline. So let's go back to a couple of things. And we are grateful that you are here. That is for sure, because people are getting amazing results and you're just a, a fantastic coach. So you go back to when you realized you didn't want to do the nine to five, what kind of response did you get from your parents um, cause I know I got an interesting response from my parents. What kind of response did you get from your parents? And also what was the catalyst that made you realize that you didn't want to do that and that there was something more? So the catalyst was really, um, I, I actually, I wasn't a very conscious, I wasn't living very consciously at this time. So it's hard for me to say what the catalyst really was, but I wanted to do things that I was good at. So when I left the hockey world, it was like, okay, well, what am I good at? I mean, I'm good at school and science and I'm good at talking to people and, you know, just messing around in the locker room. So of Mm -hmm. course that turns into the gym. Um, So, and then I just followed the breadcrumbs there, right? Like it was like, okay, well, I could work for someone and make garbage money, or I could go and work for myself and give myself the opportunity to make better money and make my own rules. Right. So, so it just kind of like, it happened organically through the next indicated step. Then we get to a place where, so there's two moments that really, I think personify the way my parents reacted. So number one was, um, I was doing pretty well in the fitness industry. I was you know, right around the six figure mark. And I was, you know, working my own hours and I was able to travel and all those types of things had a bit of an online business. I was kind of 50, 50 in person online. And, and my dad, who's a police officer sends me the job description for the, the fitness person for the police in, in our city. And it's, it's like hundred K a year plus benefits and all that. Whoa. That's way more than I thought it was going to yeah, tell me no it was like 30 K or something. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. So that's, you know, what most jobs are, but this, this is like, a, you know, it's, it's full time and it, you're running all the testing and everything for all the police in our city. Um, you know, it was a good gig. And I asked a few people and they said, Gav, like you're a few people that knew me, they're like, you're going to go crazy in this role because you just you're doing the same thing every single day. And so I had to sit down with my dad and say, you know, I'm already almost making this kind of money. And I'm happy and I'm doing something that I love. And and I I think there was a bit that there was a bit of disconnect until we could have that conversation. Mm -hmm. And then one other moment was I was taking five weeks. My wife, girlfriend at the time had done some work in Australia. Uh, She took like three months to do some work there. And and I was taking five weeks off to travel with her in Australia, New Zealand. And my parents, I was getting this bad energy off them just before I was leaving. And 
I said, what's going on? And my dad said, well, I can't, I can't leave for five weeks and just go travel to, to the other side of the world. What makes you think you can do that? And I'm like, well, dad, it's because I planned this type of a lifestyle. This is exactly what I wanted to do. And I think there was a recognition there like, oh, like he's not just flying by the seat of his pants, messing around, following a girl to some other side of the world. He's got a plan here and there's an intention behind this. So um, took some difficult conversations though. Yeah. I like how you said that you are, you weren't living consciously, which means you are now. So what is the definition of that? And how do you help people in our program and in your own coaching to live consciously so that become more successful? Yeah, I think this is, this is one of the things I said in our, when we were chatting for the video for the effortless discipline program is Carl Jung, the just old school guy, he says, um, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will rule your life and you will call it fate. And I, I was just living in a way where I was just kind of doing what I thought I was supposed to and following the norms of society, you know, lots of like watching the news and, and feel, you know, feeling the way that I think I'm supposed to feel and all those types of things, right. There was really no conscious intention behind anything. And I think, so many people, it's so easy to get sucked into that, right? Like it's so easy to get sucked into, as we talked about, you know, drinking beers on a Friday, Saturday night, because you're supposed to and sleeping in and, and checking social media and watching the news and, and ref, basically for conforming to what everyone else does. But when you realize that not that many people are actually happy, you're like, wait a second, this isn't actually working. So one of the things that I think is so important for people is to is to, like I said, make the unconscious conscious. What are the things that you don't necessarily like? And why are those things happening in your life? And notice that you can make those changes. It was actually our mutual friend, Xander Fryer, who said to me, like, never complain to me about where you live because you can move at any time. And I was like, because I live in this place where everyone complains about it. I mean, it's super cold. It's in the middle of nowhere. You know, everyone complains about it. But my wife and I have had many conversations now because I have complained in the past about why we live here and why it's important for us to stay close to family and how we can have the freedom to go other places and all those awesome things. So I think it's just about, about looking at the places that aren't working for you, right? And saying, I can, I have the power to change these how will I do that instead of like, well, I can't change anything. Craig, you're on mute. Sorry. I don't want my baby. Uh, I'm always on mute because my baby sometimes makes a lot of noise downstairs. <laughs> so uh, my mentor, Dan Kennedy said that, you know, we're not trees. We don't have roots into the ground physically, metaphorically, you might have roots, but you can always leave uh, the physical location. And here's one thing that, I had to understand because, you know, we moved to Mexico and there's days where it's like, you know, things aren't going our way or we're a long way from home, et cetera. It's, you know, it's really hot and really humid again, uh, which a lot of people can't understand why I complain about. But no matter where you live, whether it's Winnipeg or whether it's Cancun, somebody actually chooses your city to go on vacation. Like I know Winnipeg chooses somebody. Cho no, but people do. They choose do. To go to they do. Yeah. yeah. And there's, there's great things about it. So we're, we always have to just change our mindset about it. And that's key. That's really, really key. And yeah, actually, I just read this little um, tidbit on social media that ice, water, and steam are essentially, you know, they're the same thing. They're all forms of water, but they have different energy levels. And so you can be stubborn piece of ice, or you can raise your vibration and, and uh, you know, be steam and, and which I, you know, would say is the positive version. So yeah. You mentioned another thing earlier in terms of the mindset about negative reinforcement. So let's go back to the NHL. And before we talk about the negative reinforcement, because I don't think I've ever heard you mention that before, you do have a really cool story about signing a one-day contract with an NHL team. So give us a quick version yeah. of that story, like you know what it was feeling like and, and the lesson of always being ready and prepared in business and in life. Yeah, I, I don't often correct people when they say I'm a former pro hockey player, but the truth is it's it was for one day. You know, I, I played I played college and I played you know junior, but one day pro hockey player. So mm. I'm lucky we have we have a local NHL team, the Winnipeg Jets, and I was uh, selected as one of the emergency backup goalies. It's this wild program in the NHL where 
if there's only two goalies who dress for a team and if they both get hurt, well, what are you going to do, right? If they both get hurt in the same game. So the NHL put in this rule that a regular Joe like me comes off the street basically and, and steps in. So and, and once every five or 10 years, like some school teacher will happens. go in and, and play the game of his life and make 50 yeah. saves or something. And but like that, for any that of wasn't you, your story, I guess. That was not my story. For any of you Americans, right? This is like, you know, some guy off Wall Street coming in and pitching for the Yankees. Like it's or, or it's, the or the the garbage man, you know, no, no yeah, offense. It's not that you're garbage man, but like it's you know, ridiculous. Just anybody. Like it's it's it it is the true every man story of like of like your chances are done and then you get another opportunity. Right. So I, I'm, you know, scheduled for this game. And the cool part is, you know, they let your, your, you can bring up, bring a parent or bring somebody and you sit in the press box, you eat the meal, you get great seats to the game. There's five or six of us. So I was scheduled for this one game and I'm actually coaching. I was coaching our, our women's university team. And I get, I get off the ice and like my phone is just like going crazy with calls and texts from the same number. I'm like, what's going on? And I'm about to leave and, you know, go downtown to pick up my mom and go to the game. Well, it's the goalie coach from the Washington Capitals, the former, you know, the year before the Stanley Cup champions. And he says, hey, hey, Gav, um, got your number from, you know, the Jets folks. We need you tonight. We need you. We need you to get downtown. As oh, soon so as it works for like both teams. I play for I basically could play for both teams. Fascinating. It's wild. So I can't, I can't be like affiliated with the jets or anything right. like that. Right. Uh, so here I go, I got the 30 minute drive ahead of me. I'm, you know, calling, calling my girlfriend, trying to get a hold of my mom who I'm supposed to be meeting and taking downtown, trying to get a hold of my dad. Who's like, you know, out for sushi and, you know, living his bachelor life. Cause my mom's out for the night huh. and the jets were nice enough to allow my parents to come, which was really cool. But I get downtown you know, I throw my, my hockey equipment over my shoulder and I walk in and I walk right into the jets who will be my opponent that night playing their like warm up game. And they're like, who is this guy? Like what's going on? Next stop is, uh, anyone who knows hockey knows who Alexander Ovechkin is. He is standing with his hand out saying, hi, I'm Alex. Nice to meet you. Wow. And it was, it was absolutely wild. They treated me like a part of their team. I, so the moral is, you know, I got to dress, uh, signed a one day amateur contract, got to dress. I went out for warmups with them in, you know, my hometown rink, which was just incredible. Even though I, I think I stopped like one out of 10 shots in the warmups. I got a couple puck marks on the Jersey. Um, and I got, you know, a front row seat to watch. They, they allowed me to keep the Jersey. You can see it behind me. I got a couple signed sticks, one from Ovechkin, which is really cool. And I just got this experience of just basically, I was a pro for a day or half a day, which was just super, super cool. Did you get to pick your number? No, they just, they just, they just threw like whatever number it's number 41. What's the name on the back? Mikhail. Okay. So, so they did have time to stitch you up. It's actually, if you look at it, the stitching is like a mess. Like it's hilarious. The the guy was just obviously like, we got to get this name on the thing. Yeah. They, and they even made a name bar for me for the, for my stall and everything. It was just so cool what they did for me. Man, that that is absolutely amazing. So, so that's the positive side of, you never know what life is going to throw at you. Now you, you, but you said there was a lot of negative reinforcement in your hockey career. So what does that look like? And then how does one deal with that and fight it off in if, you know, somebody's a business owner, a busy lawyer, accountant, or is in a relationship where there's a lot of negative reinforcement? Yeah. So, you know, I will preface this by saying that I, I was not <laughs> the person that I needed to be to have success. So I was not in the right headspace. Um, yeah. I was not ready for the opportunity that I had when I was playing junior and college hockey. I, you know, I was a child for lack of a better term. And, but what, one of the big things was, you know, whenever we jump on calls, you know, you're always sharing wins and and our team is sharing wins and positive things. And, and you're not afraid to say, Hey, Gav, really appreciate what you're doing. You know, that is new to me, especially from other men, you know, other men saying positive things and going a little deeper than just, you know, you know, ribbing me and giving me a hard time. Right. That's how, that's how the hockey world communicates. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately it's become, you know, the only reinforcement you get is negative because that's coaching. Right. Did you find it different in, I mean, 
it was one game, but you're in the Washington uh, Capitals locker room. Alex Ovechkin positively meets yeah. you, meets you in a positive man. Like, did you notice that it was different than your junior? Yes. So that's what was really interesting is, you know, there was no, they, 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 these guys could have easily stuck me in another room, laughed at me, said, this is stupid. This is a joke. And they, they welcomed me in. And that was one of the first times in my hockey career that, you know, I felt that way, uh -huh. you know? And so the hockey world and not to indict them, but just a lot of the world is you're always looking for the negatives. Right. And, and, I mean, we do this in our own heads too, right? It's like, what, what did I do wrong there? What could I fix, right? Instead of, instead of bragging about ourselves, we're always told to be humble, right? Well, being humble is a good thing, but like, you know, you can pat yourself on the back too, right? Because for me, when someone reinforces me in a positive way, I'm, I'm going to run through a brick wall for them. Like, let's do it, you know? But when you reinforce me in a negative way, like, I mean, obviously sometimes changes need to be made but if someone's just constantly ragging on me i'm just going to stop listening yeah. it's just like it doesn't work for me and I, I think so many coaches who you know maybe don't have the skill sets or maybe aren't able to um get past their own demons generally tend to focus on the negative reinforcement or the negative like stop doing that instead of hey keep doing this you're doing great with this. Yeah. And, and it's, it's a, it's a refreshing take. I can say that. What were some of the positive sides of coaching and accountability that you saw along the way? And then how important is that to what you do in our effortless discipline program right now? So the first thing was creating a relationship. I learned this in the fitness world, actually creating a relationship of unconditional positive regard. So this is something that, who did you learn that from, or did you learn so that on your own? I actually learned that in, in school, oh, which okay. might be the one thing that I took from university. Well, uh, <laughs> I mean, and some exercise maybe, physiology. Yeah. Maybe some exercise physiology, some, some, you know, where the joints are and stuff, but um, yeah. So unconditional positive regard of just like, Hey, look, like, you know, even if you totally screw up, you know, as long as you, as long as you don't do anything illegal, right. I'm going to, I'm going to regard you positively because I'm going to see the best in you. Right. And, and that's my job as your coach. And then my job as your coach is to, is to be an objective observer. You mentioned this right outside eyes, be an objective observer. That's a, that allows you to ask better questions of yourself. Right. So whether it's fitness or whether it's coaching is how can I be the objective observer that says like, okay, yeah, you, you totally screwed the pooch on that one. All right. Um, what can we learn from that? Or where, where maybe were there positives that came out of that? Or what feedback did that give you? How can you use that to be better next time, right? That, in my opinion, is the job of coaching. It is being the objective observer, being the outside eyes, and having a conditional positive regard. Like, and even when my coaches in the past, like some of my business coaches who have been great coaches for me, have, you know, been like, you know, gotten angry or not gotten angry, but, you know, maybe not been totally positive. I knew it was coming from a place of positive regard because of the, the relationship that had been created throughout that container. Mm -hmm. Okay. So recently, you know, as, as a type of person who's in our program and in my world, you're always looking to improve. And so a few months ago, you set out on a goal of not drinking any alcohol. Was it for the summer, the rest of the year? So it was originally for three months. Yep. Um, and then I, ex I extended it to six months. Uh huh. Um, and so we went to July 1st. And then I said, I got to tip over to more than half of the year. Yeah. So on July 2nd, I thought, look, I don't know if I want to be that, like, like the person that like doesn't drink. Right. You know, just the world I had grown up in. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to try one. So I had a beer. And it was awful. I was just like, this sucks. I've totally lost the taste. And I was like, I think, I think this is done for me. So I, I, uh, I decided that I was going to do it. And then I, once I had passed that, that mark, I was like, oh, I'm going to see if, if this is something for me. And then it was just like, you know what? No, this isn't for me. It's, it's not worth, it's not worth it. Yeah. Yeah. That was the big thing.
So you shared that in our weekly team meeting, we do lots of personal development in our weekly team meeting and lots of, uh, you know, training on our own programs like the Effortless Discipline Bootcamp program that Gavin's part of. You shared that with us for public accountability. Yeah. How, how do you, you know, how did that help you, you know, through <laughs> some, maybe some struggles early on when, you know, you're making that transition and then yeah. how do you apply that to the people in our program and what's been like one of the biggest wins there for our clients? Yeah. So public accountability, I mean, that one, and then also I'll, I'll never forget one of my first group uh, calls with our, with our team where I was talking about a date night and you're like, well, why can't you do a date night with your wife? And I'm like, I guess I can. You're like, okay, well, what night is it going to be? I'm like Thursdays. You're like, great. Tell us about how it was. We yeah. haven't missed a date night since. Great. Um, and that is, you know, you talk about this, someone you don't deeply don't want to disappoint. So there were moments for accountability. You want to find for someone you deeply do not want to disappoint. Yeah. And there were moments when with the drinking habit where like I went to a wedding and I went to a bachelor party. Man, uh, that's tough. Yeah. And, and, and there were moments where that, you know, at the wedding, a glass of champagne was literally put in front of me on the table. Right. Yeah. And I love a good glass of champagne at a glass at a, at a wedding. You know, it's, it's, it's great. And it was like, no, I've committed to something here. Mm -hmm. And one of the other things was, so on the flip side of, of someone you don't want to disappoint, my wife had told me numerous times how much she respected this decision that I had made and how, how hard I was working at it. So yeah. again, the positive reinforcement of, Hey, I really respect what you're doing here. And I know that it's hard for you. And I know that it's been a challenge. And I just want you to know that I respect it. That was super, like my wife was sitting right beside me. And I, you know, I easily could have had that glass of champagne and not told you guys or whatever, but that's yeah. not the man that I want to be. And that's not the man she expects me to be. So yeah. that, that was really positive. Now, when it comes to our group, I mean, one of the things I'll always do is we'll go through, say, a 90 day, you know, a 90 day planning session or a 30 day planning session or, uh, one of the really powerful things we did was around procrastination um, and beating procrastination. And so I had everyone go through a worksheet and then they got to the point where it's like, okay, well, what are you going to stop procrastinating on? And then I said, and I'd like you to share that in the chat of our zoom call. And what are you willing to be held accountable to? And there was maybe six or seven people on the call and they all shared. And I said, okay, there's seven other people here that are going to hold you accountable to that. And one of our guys, uh, Kevin, who's now graduated into our one-on-one -on -one program, he, he was really struggling with some government contract. And anyone who's ever worked with the government, it's a complete pain, right? It's like pages and pages of just junk. And it was like, okay, I only have to take the next step on this. Like he was procrastinating it because it was the big, you know, the big elephant in the room. It's like, I just got to do the next thing. And then he kept doing that day after day. And he had the whole thing done. It was like 20 some pages plus a whole bunch of, you know, back and forth phone calls and emails from with the federal government. And it was done, I think in three weeks, it was done, dusted, completely finished. And he had moved on to the next thing. And they're with a pharmaceutical company. So like it had to get done. If it didn't get done, they weren't moving forward. So it was, that was a big win. Yeah. You know, it's, it's one thing to know what to do. It's another thing to follow through on it. So that's a, it's a game changer that you're the accountability for so many people. Is there anything else? I think some of our female clients in the program have achieved stuff that they didn't expect to, whether it was uh, revenue gains. I, I think that was Marcy. Um, other things that you want to share, like where you as the accountability were the impetus for them succeeding. Yeah, well, I mean, Marcy's a really interesting uh, case. She she was aware enough to know that the majority of what was happening was internal, like she was fighting herself. Mm -hmm. She knew that, right? And so to to get and early on in the program, I think I told you guys this. Like, we jumped on a call like three weeks in because she was like, "I don't know if I can afford this. I, you know, this is a lot. You know, mm -hmm. Oh man, this is too much," kind of thing. And and the recognition was there that she was fighting herself basically. And, um, this was around a number of things, personal stuff with her family, uh, work stuff, uh, you know, keeping consistent with social media, making sales, making money. She was always worried about making more money. Um, and 
basically I just kept her on the path of just like, Hey, what can you do? What can you do? Um, helping her rethink things, changing her perspective on things, and then holding her accountable to what she said she was going to do, which is a big thing, right? Well, two months in, she had, she literally, they doubled their income. She owns a car detailing shop. If anyone's in Brenham, Texas, need your car detailed. Where, where car. in Texas is that? I have no idea. Oh. <laughs> Somewhere Small in Texas. Place, Texas. They'll find Small it. town, Texas. Yeah. Um, if anyone's there and needs their car detailed, but they doubled their income. And I, I said, you know, like, what did you change in terms of like, you know, your marketing or anything? She's like, nothing. I just, I just was consistent with everything that I did. I was consistent on my own work and like personal development work. Uh, we were more consistent with our, you know, family dinners and making sure that the kids were on the same page as us. And she, her and her husband are business partners. We were more consistent, you know, as, as husband and wife having date nights and things like that. And then all of a sudden they doubled their income. She looked at her monthly income for June and she was like, whoa, there it is. Look at that. Yeah. You know? So earlier you talked, when you were talking about her, you were talking about how there was some negative voices in her head, the ice hockey goalie, man, you know, so he oh. lets in a goal, whether it's, whether it's a breakaway goal from Ovechkin or whether it's a soft goal, how do you get your mind right? You know, like you're the last line of defense and, you know, the crowd is on you, you know, you're in a way game. What is, what does Gavin do to get his mind right in that situation? So if you're asking me in the context of hockey, I can tell you what not to do. Uh, and that's everything that I did. Um, and that, this is why I think this is why I feel this is so powerful is because I've been on the other side of negative self-talk and of just beating myself up. It's funny you asked this. We just finished our group call, our, our tribe call, as we're calling it with the effortless discipline program. And we were talking about this and we were talking about the inner critic and, you know, the, the heckler or the judge or whoever it is that the devil on your shoulder saying, you're not good enough. You, you screwed that up. You blew it. And I think one of the record, when, when I recognized this thing, it changed so much about my relationship, I guess, with my inner critic or my relationship with my ego. And that was that that inner critic is actually trying to protect you. They're not trying to hurt you. Right. So if you can, what we did today was we named our inner critic and then we wrote a little story about how they're trying to protect us. And the important part about the inner critic or the ego or the shadow self or whatever you want to call it is they are there to help. Like they're trying to keep you safe. They're trying to keep you from, you know, doing something stupid or killing yourself or hurting somebody else or whatever, but they should not be driving the bus that is your life and your business. Okay. They're a good navigator. They're a good backseat driver. They are not a good driver. You should be driving the bus and the goal of naming and, and learning about your inner critic is to turn down the dial. And if I had had that skill when I was playing hockey, that I could turn down the volume of my inner critic, right. And recognize that I like the, the critic can criticize me all they want for that bad goal that I just let in, but I cannot change that. There's nothing that I can do to change that. It's happened. The only thing I can do is learn from it. And that's when you start to recognize that failure is actually the best form of feedback, right? So every time I let in a goal, I could actually learn from that. And if I could have shifted that, I've, I've worked on that with some of the goalies I've coached in recent years of, hey, in practice, when you let in a goal, I want you to look at that as a positive because it gives you feedback for what not to do next time or what not, what's not working. Just totally flipping that around from like, I suck, I'm the worst to, okay, that wasn't very good. What can I learn from that? How can I move forward now and be better next time? Yeah, every past experience really shows you what not to do in a lot of yeah. cases. And a, a lot of people come into our lives to show us what not to do. So that's exactly that's really, uh, really powerful there. And so the last thing that I want to ask you about is you talked about the power of the tribe, the tribe calls. You were, you were, you know, somewhat in a tribe for a long time and with every hockey team that you played for. Talk about in general, first of all, the power of finding the right tribe and then what it's been like leading the powerful tribe of the Effortless Discipline Bootcamp. Yeah. So I think uh, one of our other coaches, Ron said this really well, that like uh, the right tribe or the right community will hold you to a higher standard, right? So find people 
who are doing what you want to be doing and go and and hang out with them as much as possible, whether that's, you know, going to have a dinner or whether that's, uh, you know, getting involved in some sort of a coaching program. It's ideally, it's a formal, it's more of a formal arrangement where you're in, in a community that is, is doing a whole bunch of people who are at that higher level or who are striving for that higher level that you're striving for. I think, I think that's, what's been super powerful. A lot of the people will come into our community and I think they'll have this, this recognition that they don't often say, and maybe don't often even recognize consciously of, oh, I'm not the only one with these problems. You know, someone asks a question and you can see like 10 other people nodding on the Zoom call, right? They're like, oh yeah, yeah. And they're leaning in, right? They're like, I was afraid to ask this question, but I'm glad they did, right? Um, I, think, I think that's a big, a big thing where you can, you can kind of like, for lack of a better term, go into battle with those other people who are, who are fighting the same fight. Right. And th that was, that was the beauty of the hockey locker room is, is you were all fighting the same fight. So you have no choice, but to become a community and to become a tribe. That's, you know, the sum is greater than the parts, right? They, they, you just keep moving forward together. And what's been super cool about our tribe calls is sometimes someone asks a question and before I can even answer three people have answered in the chat you know, like, like they just have different skill sets and, and, and you recognize like, I'm, I'm like, I'm not the digital marketing guy and the digital marketing guy answers the question. Right. And it's like, Oh, great. Thanks. I'll let you two connect on the, you know, offline or somewhere else. That's great. Um, I don't know. Yeah. If, was, was there more to that question or is that? No, no, that that's really it. And I will say that, you know, first of all, there's the classic Jim Rohn quote that you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And if you have, if you're part of a powerful tribe of like-minded people, you're going to become a powerful, like-minded person. If you yeah. hang around people that are fit, if you hang around great hockey players, you're going to become a fit, great hockey player. If you hang around people that are always negative, you're going to become a negative person. And so the power of a tribe can go both ways, which is why people need to be in the right one, like our effortless discipline boot camp tribe. But I'll also say this that our team. In our meetings, you know, for the early to rise, our company and our coaching meetings and our sales meetings and our marketing meetings, that you know, you're part of a lot of those meetings. I think there's a powerful tribe element there where there's positive yeah. reinforcement, there's public accountability, there's all those things that are in our team meetings that are also in our coaching program. And I'm very grateful that you're a part of that because you bring so much great energy for that and so much expertise, both as a high performer, but also as a coach. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Like there's the positive reinforcement guys. There it is right there. Anyone listening? Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I, I remember just a quick, quick story to finish up the, the first, one of the first like sale, the sales marketing huddles that we've been doing, you know, and it was just like ideas were flying back and forth and, and people were saying, Hey, you know, are you going to do that? Or who's going to do that? Or, you know, um, Hey, what about this? Or what about this? I don't know if that's going to work. And it was like, it was just like this, this whole nother level where you're just like, man, like this is what it's about. And like, I, I'll do anything I can to get to those and spend more time on those because those just raise your whole vibration for the rest of the day, the rest of the week. Like that's what it's about. So I, thank you for that positive reinforcement. And I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of that team. Well, it's amazing. And we're just getting started. We had a couple more people sign up for the Effortless Discipline Bootcamp uh, yes. again today. It's an eight-week program. It helps people become super disciplined, insanely productive, and just helps them take their le uh, life to the next level. And, you know, And not everyone is an entrepreneur in the program. We have lawyers. We have accountants. Um, what else do we have in there aside from entrepreneurs, lawyers, and accountants? Yeah, we got like um, the one Real guy estate agents. Yeah. Yeah, I'm real estate investors. We got the one guy who was a VP for a pharmaceutical company. We've got um, digital marketers. Uh, we've got a, a lot of uh, affiliate marketers. Like it's um, it's a it's really high performers who just want to get to the next level, right? Yeah, and you you said it really well. Like it's those folks who they know that they've got like you know a race car under the hood, uh, but they're sitting on the infield spinning their tires in the mud. And all we, all we do is we say, Hey, here's the systems. We put you back on the track and we, we tell you to press the gas pedal, you know, and you can, you can fire it up.
Exactly. Exactly. I love that analogy. Well, listen, if anybody listening wants to learn more about our Effortless Discipline Bootcamp program, uh, we would love to chat with you. So just send me an email at craig at craigvalentine.com or an Instagram message at real Craig Valentine. And we look forward to helping you, you know, just go 200 miles an hour down the straightaway once we get your wheels uh, out of being stuck in the mud. So Gavin, thank you so much for being on here. I know that you've got a lot more stories and, and lessons and discipline and mindset hacks to share with us. We'll have you uh, back on the call again soon and, and find out how your no alcohol campaign right. is going and hear about more success stories from the program. So thanks for joining us today.